Hi, it's Deepak Pakbat from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School reporting for ACC.org from the European Society of Cardiology and World Cardiology Congress in Paris. I'm here with Professor Gabriel Steg, uh, also from Paris and the University of Paris, where he is Chief of Cardiology at Hôpital Bichat, a wonderful institution that I've had the privilege of visiting. So we're going to talk about all the good stuff presented today. Well, actually, we're not going to talk about all the good stuff. There's too much good stuff to cover. But we'll start off with the AFIR trial. What do you think of that one? Well, that's a, it's addressing a very interesting question. What should we do in terms of antiplatelet therapy in patients who have the need for oral anticoagulation for AFib right. and are one year behind or one year post-PCI or cabbage? Should we add aspirin to oral anticoagulation or keep oral anticoagulation alone? There are a lot of strong opinions on this and very little data. Right. And this is a Japanese trial of a little over 2,200 patients that compared rivaroxaban alone or rivaroxaban plus aspirin. Now, there are a number of things that I need to say. The dose of rivaroxaban was the Japanese dose, which is 15 milligrams for most patients with normal renal function and a reduced dose of 10 milligrams, so slightly lower than what is used in most Western countries. And the other thing is the trial was prematurely terminated for safety reasons. That being said, what the investigators found seems pretty clear. They found no clinical benefit from adding aspirin to rivaroxaban in terms of preventing ischemic events, and they found a substantial increase in bleeding related to the addition of aspirin. So that would argue strongly for oral anticoagulation alone. I think these data are really intriguing, spectacular. We want to commend these investigators. We probably want to have more data with the conventional doses in broader populations, particularly in the West, to confirm this. And there are several trials that are starting, including one in France called Aquatic. Right. So we are very eager to see more evidence in this space. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. I mean, the trial I thought was very well done, but you know, it's specific to one geographic region. It's a dose that's a reduced dose of anticoagulant compared to the usual AFib dose uh, in the West. And the trial was stopped uh, early because of uh, a mortality finding. So. Yeah, I, I think more data are definitely needed. But it, it more or less does jive, I think, with European practice, where in general you guys just go with an anticoagulant, right? Well, it's interesting. In Europe, Europe is sort of split north-south. Ah. Scandinavia, the UK, the Netherlands tend to use oral anticoagulation alone, which is the general recommendation of the guidelines. But I know there was a strong discussion in the guideline committee, and there's a, a footnote to the guidelines <laughs> saying, and it was driven by Latin countries, such as France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, saying... Ah. If you, you guys want, are always causing trouble. If you want to add aspirin, you can consider adding aspirin. So, and I think it reflects the lack of evidence. Yeah, and the so US now we're starting to accumulate evidence thanks to this trial. Yeah, in the U.S., most people still, I think, favor having the antiplatelet on board. But the registry data do show more bleeding with the, the combos you'd expect without a clear efficacy signal. So more data coming, but this is a good start with a fire. Uh, what else caught your fancy here at this study? Well, I was very study. impressed with the 16-year follow-up of Dynami right, 2. Yeah. You know, you'll remember the NAMI-2 was one of the landmark trials that established the superiority of primary PCI over thrombolysis in acute myocardial infarction. And there are two pieces of information that are really important here. The first one is the Danish investigators were able to uh, accrue 16-year follow-up with vital status collected in 99.7% of the patients. It's amazing. I mean, this is amazing. And um, I think it's a testimony to the value of these systems that are in place in these countries to monitor patients, it's something that we should really try to emulate in all of our countries, North America, but also other countries in Western Europe, to gather that quality of information. This is amazing. The second information is that the benefit was maintained right. with a cardiovascular mortality benefit that's quite substantial in favor of primary PCI. So that's really good news. Again, selecting primary PCI over thrombolysis improves early outcomes, midterm outcomes, and very long-term outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. So this is more great data for primary PCI. Really, it's the standard of care for STEMI and for regions of the world where there aren't as many primary PCI centers, say, as in Paris or Boston. I'd say establish systems of transfer of care so you can get these patients in pretty quickly to centers that can offer PCI. So great data for PCI. Uh, there's good stuff presented about SACU Mutual Valsartan as well, different uh, studies looking at mechanistic insights, so some more help there in understanding exactly how that drug fits into clinical practice. Uh, there was a, a, a study I was involved with uh, that was from McMaster University and, and Brigham and Women's Hospital, two center study where we looked at cardiolinguistics. So what that means is we used machine learning 
to actually analyze the tape recordings of physician interviews of patients describing chest pain. And uh, what we found was, was kind of interesting. First of all, you know, a lot of these uh, differences between typical and so-called atypical angina between men and women are overblown. In fact, men have atypical symptoms, women most often have typical symptoms, and you know, that sort of construct of, of, of atypical chest pain being associated with women and typical with men is largely untrue. Yeah, uh, both is, have both types of symptoms. It, it's really interesting because there was just a paper in JAHA that pointed oh, right, that yes. out, that, you know, that there's no real evidence to support the idea, the concept that's widely popularized, that women have more frequently atypical symptoms than men, and I think that caregivers have to be aware of this. Symptoms can be very typical in women. In fact, they're as often typical as in men. Yeah, no, you're right. And, and, and there might be more atypical symptoms in women, but the, the real thing is they have as many typical symptoms as well. There might be some atypical thrown out. It's a very complex story, but, but we use machine learning to try to get around some Pretty of the neat. potential biases that humans might have. Not to say machine learning can't have biases, but that's another topic for another day. There's another uh, study I, I was fortunate to be involved with that Brian Ferentz from uh, Cambridge presented, looking at LDL and systolic blood pressure in a Mendelian randomization. So nature are randomizing people to different genes associated with the lower or higher levels of cholesterol and blood pressure, showing that both were essentially independent additive uh, risk factors and risk markers and causally related to atherosclerosis. The point being that relatively modest reductions in blood pressure and cholesterol when accrued over a lifetime, as one would get from a genetic randomization, are associated with substantial reductions in risk. So if we do a better job with the simple stuff starting early in childhood or maybe even uh, really uh, from infancy in controlling these risk factors, it should have a large effect on the prevalence of cardiovascular disease. I would very much like to see what happens very, very long term on cognition from these Mendelian randomization studies because I think there's a lot of evidence suggesting but not proving so far that these factors may also be at play in preserving cognition and I think that this is the scourge that we have to face beyond cardiovascular disease. When patients survive cardiovascular events, then they live longer, and then one of their concerns is avoiding dementia and cognitive dysfunction. And I, I'm almost convinced, but not, we don't have the evidence yet, that again, these factors must be at play. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think we ought to wrap up for the sake of time. Hopefully that was some good stuff for the audience back home, but please tune in to acc.org where we've got lots of great content for you and full coverage of everything happening here at ESC.